and welcome to this um, first session in our week-long um, celebration uh, of four years um, since the GDPR. Uh, I'm uh, very delighted to welcome you all here today. My name is Estelle de Hon QC. Um, I'll be running the session um, in conjunction with my colleague and friend in chambers, Dr. Christina Leonard. Uh, so uh, a few uh, technical matters before we get into um, how we're going to run today. Um, you'll be aware if you joined a few minutes early um, that we are running closed captioning um, for this event. So if you click on the CC button at the bottom of the screen, um, you'll see a sentence which allows you either to show subtitles or show captions. And once you click on those, you'll be able to see the closed captions. Uh, the way that today will run is we'll uh, divide the uh, topic up between the two of us uh, and we're looking at uh, ideally giving 50 minutes at the end for questions, so we'll see how we go. Uh, I'm going to deal with the first couple of topics, which is um, introducing the uh, session and looking at what has stayed the same in relation to the GDPR and the UK GDPR. Um, then Christina will deal with what has changed or requires review and uh, give you a little bit of an update in relation to recent case law and ICO decisions. Uh, I'll look at what's coming in the future. Uh, thank you for those of you who've already sent us in some questions. Uh, we'll deal with a few of those and then we'll hopefully have some time at the end uh, to answer some questions as they come in. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please do put them into the um, into the Q&A function um, rather than into the chat because it's the Q&A function that Christina and I will be monitoring. And to deal with the first, absolutely, Jenna, uh, we will be uh, distributing the slides and we'll also make a recording of the event available um, in due course. And if there are any, any questions uh, which we haven't been able to deal with live or in the chat or in the Q&A function, um, then um, we'll deal with those um, two in due course. So. Uh, with that introduction to kick off, um, what is it um, that we are going to be dealing with and how did we get here? Well, as you are all very well aware, uh, the GDPR became directly applicable um, in the EU 25th of May 2018 and the Data Protection Act 2018 was introduced at the same time. So for uh, a number of years now, we've been dealing with the dual um, obligations um, and dealing with moving between the two sets of obligations, the GDPR and the Data Protection Act, with the Data Protection Act supplementing what was in the GDPR. Uh, of course, there were some areas that weren't covered by the GDPR um, with law enforcement processing um, standing uh, outside of that and the Data Protection Act dealing with um, law enforcement matters. Since the 31st of December 2020, um, we've had the retained EU law version of the GDPR, which applies in the United Kingdom together with the DPA, and that's what's called the UK GDPR. Um, in a nutshell, the UK GDPR is very heavily arrived from the GDPR. So generally the terms and the concepts have the same meaning um, and they continue to be operative um, subject to any exceptions, uh, in particular the ones carved out by the DPA. And like its predecessor, the UK GDPR applies to the processing of personal data. It provides rights to individuals, data subjects whose data is processed, and it imposes, imposes obligations both on controllers and processors of personal data. So the key principles, the rights and the obligations remain the same. There are a few discrete changes which have already taken place. And of course, the key thing uh, that was one of the drivers behind um, or, or ostensibly one of the drivers behind moving away from the EU is that we have the opportunity in the United Kingdom to move and tweak and go further away um, from the um, GDPR through amending the UK GDPR. And I will come and talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, there's also the potential uh, for something called the frozen GDPR, um, which is the GDPR at the point where we left the European Union um, to come into play, depending on circumstances, and Christina will address that in due course. So I'm going to start off with what stayed the same. But I'm going to assume that because you've come to this webinar, um, you're particularly interested in what has changed rather than what has stayed the same. So although there's a lot of content in this section, I'm going to take it fairly quickly. I'm not going to address everything on the slide um, so that we can get to the juicier bits which um, Christina is dealing with uh, as soon as we can. So what has stayed the same? Key principles 
have stayed exactly the same. The definition of personal data, which is there on your screen, is the same in the, U uh, the EU GDPR and the UK GDPR. Um, similarly, um, special category data, um, which requires particular safeguards, remains the same as well. Uh, the seven data protection principles remain the same, um, which again are set out there on the screen, including at the moment the adequacy principle and the accountability principle, which um, remain exactly the same as they were, requiring um, controllers and processors to be able to demonstrate their compliance with all of the other principles. I say that that remains the same for now because um, that element of accountability and how much it requires of controllers and processors is one of the things which is under the microscope in relation to potential change. Similarly, the rights of UK data subjects um, have remained exactly the same. And they're again set out there um, on the slides, underpinned um, by Article 12 and by the general obligations um, in relation to um, informing individuals about what is happening with data processing and data controlling. Again, Christina will talk a bit about that um, as one of the areas where there's been a slight change under the UK GDPR. So all those rights remain um, as they were under the EU GDPR. Uh, I'll mention a little bit towards the end something that might change in relation to the right of access uh, with the potential for reform um, that's been announced by the UK government uh, last year and more recently in the Queen's speech. The applicability of the UK GDPR uh, is also the same as the EU GDPR, so it doesn't apply to anonymous data. If you genuinely have anonymized that information so that the individual is no longer identifiable, um, then uh, GDPR doesn't apply. Um, it, similarly, the GDPR does not relate to or apply to data relating to deceased persons. I'll pause there just to mention this, which was an oddity in the way that the UK GDPR um, and indeed the EU GDPR identified that. Uh, that emphasis on the fact that there was no applicability to the uh, information of people who had passed away um, was really derived from the recitals to the EU GDPR. And so a question arose um, in particular when um, the process of putting the UK GDPR in place was undertaken and when um, the Keeling schedule in particular was released. So the Keeling schedule for um, data protection and law nerds um, is a document that's produced um, by the government, which shows all in detail, all the changes with things scratched out or things added so that you can see the previous text uh, and the updated text, but the recitals weren't there. And that uh, drove a question in some areas, have the recitals been retained or haven't they? Um, but there's a long and complicated answer by way of the um, EU Withdrawal Act and what retained legislation means. Uh, but the upshot of that is that actually the recitals have been retained. Um, that's been made clear um, in the Withdrawal Act um, and indeed in some of the um, consequential EU um, statements. So the recitals are definitely part of the UK GDPR, although oddly, the text of the recitals hasn't been changed. So there's a bit of a mismatch there. However, the recitals remain as a key element of guidance as to what the articles of the UK GDPR mean. And one of the key bits of guidance is that the UK GDPR does not, unless the UK changes that, uh, relate to information um, concerning people who have passed away. Um, back to the slide, applicability, um, the processing of personal data for purely household activities um, falls outside of the UK GDPR, um, as does um, the processing um, for uh, criminal um, offences and criminal penalties uh, and um, the data relating to legal persons. Um, what then about the lawfulness of the processing of um, information that does uh, still fall under the UK GDPR? Well, the key element is that you still require a lawful basis for the processing of personal information. So to be lawful, the processing must take place under the bases um, of one of the six um, bases, which is provided um, under Article 6. Um, either we've got consent um, or you've got one of the other lawful bases for processing. And then remember, when you've got special category personal information, you are additionally required to have uh, a, base, a basis under Article 9 for that processing. 
It continues to be the case that for the most part, if you are a public authority, that you cannot rely on legitimate interests in order to undertake your processing. There are some um, exceptions to that, but in general, you're not relying on legitimate interests. Also in general, because of the nature of consent and how it is required to be um, freely given and able uh, easily to be uh, withdrawn, it's unlikely that you're going to be relying on the consent of individuals for processing their personal data unless there's very specific circumstances. Uh, you're generally uh, going to be relying on other bases of uh, processing to be lawful. In terms of accountability, there's still an obligation to show that you are compliant, whatever the nature of uh, you, your processing and whatever type of controller or processor that you are. And these obligations are interwoven through the UK GDPR, uh, both in terms of how you uh, comply with the principles and how you undertake your record keeping um, and your uh, explaining to people with whom you interact about how you comply with your obligations. Um, Article 5 in particular describes the principles of data processing um, and requires the controller to be able to demonstrate their uh, accountability. What then about the very useful sets of guidelines or guidance um, which the EU Data Protection Board uh, was responsible for producing, uh, which illuminated the uh, EU um, data protection obligations and which will continue to illuminate the GDPR um, within the EU. Uh, the ICO has stated that although the, those guidelines no longer are directly relevant to the UK data protection regime, they clearly still provide helpful guidance. Um, and indeed, we've popped a list of um, useful recent guidelines uh, uh, on the slide, uh, and the ICO's guidance is still fairly close to the Data Protection Board guidelines. Plainly, as the UK GDPR changes and is amended and is more different from the EU GDPR, the usefulness of the EU Data uh, Protection Board guidelines will diminish. But for the moment, um, there's a very close alignment and so they're very useful indeed. Uh, Lots of text on this, um, so don't worry, I'm not going to go through it in um, particular detail. Data protection officers um, still um, remain a requirement. Uh, you're, as a public authority, required to designate a data protection officer, although you can share a designated data protection officer between organisations. And then data protection officers are required for um, other sorts of entities as set out in the UK GDPR. Um, and the data protection officer has various statutory obligations. We've set out there on the slide uh, recital 97 of the uh, UK GDPR, which still gives some guidance about the um, expertise and the level of knowledge that data protection officers are required to have, their level of independence um, from those um, who they are assisting, uh, and the uh, other factors that are required required uh, for a proper data protection officer position. Um, that all still also remains the same under the UK GDPR. Security requirements are still very much part of the UK GDPR. Um, Article 5.1.F in particular requires you um, to ensure the integrity and confidentiality of personal data. And so you have to have appropriate security, both electronic and physical and through policies in order to ensure that data um, is kept safely and securely. And that in particular nowadays uh, requires you to have very good cyber security, because if there are cyber breaches, Features, um, even the sorts of cyber breach um, where you feel that there's um, maybe not necessarily um, as much uh, negligence or as much um, difficulty that has been caused by the way that you've acted, um, even uh, that type of cyber breach uh, is something that could cause you significant difficulties under the GDPR. Uh, and we'll uh, discuss in the later part of this seminar or webinar uh, the recent ICO fine for a breach in this regard um, by against a law firm. Um, note that the UK GDPR continues to define personal data breach as a breach of security, um, leading to accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, etc., um, of personal data. Uh, and so the security requirements are still um, very broad in that regard. Um, in relation to data breaches, this all stays the same as well. Um, subjects have, or individuals have the right to claim compensation through the courts. 
Uh, and there's uh, one of the um, sessions later on in this week in, uh, in our information law week is going to be dealing in some detail with this. Um, we've got um, county courts being the correct forum for simple data protection breaches and the high courts for more complicated. Uh, we've got uh, this interaction between the GDPR, the UK GDPR and other torts um, that have uh, has now been um, examined and maybe simplified in recent high court authority. They are unlikely to add much um, and negligence is out in relation to data uh, breaches. Again, that's something that Christina will be dealing with um, in more detail a bit later on. And under uh, looking at the ICO, finally, um, the ICO continues to be our supervisory authority with the full panoply of rights and obligations um, that the ICO previously had under the EU GDPR. Uh, in particular, the fining ability for the ICO uh, remains the same uh, with the particular uh, ability for very significant fines uh, related to turnover of uh, companies and corporate entities. So that all remains very much as it was before. I'll pick up a little bit towards the end um, where that might change um, in relation to the ICO uh, and um, how the ICO will function. So that has all stayed the same. What, though, has changed? And I'll hand over uh, to Christina for this um, section of the webinar. Thank you very much, Estelle. Um, good morning, everyone, from me as well, and I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, so now that we've heard what has stayed the same, uh, we're, we're moving on to the topic of what has changed or what, at the very least, requires our attention and reflection now that we are operating within the framework of the UK GDPR. Um, next slide, please, Estelle. Thank you. Um, so the first thing that I want to highlight is mainly directed as, at those of you who are joining us from local authorities or public authorities more generally. You, you may know that not all personal data is captured by the UK GDPR, and that was the same under the EU GDPR, uh, regardless of how it is processed. In a nutshell, personal data needs to be processed either wholly or partly by automated means, or where that is not the case, form part of, uh, or is intended to form part of a filing system. So there needs to be some sort of um, uh, processing mechanism in, in, in place that has some sort of system to it for personal data to be captured by the UK GDPR. So for example, if you call a colleague over the phone and share personal data, a person's personal data in, in the process of that, and you share it verbally, that would not normally be captured by the UK GDPR. Now, that does not mean that we can all just go around and share sensitive information about others, um, so long as it's done verbally, because of course, you might still have issues there with regard to uh, confidentiality, for example. However, the point is that such processing would not normally trigger liability under the UK GDPR because the UK GDPR does not cover non-automated information which is not or is not intended to be forming part of the filing system and as I said that was the same under the EU GDPR the UK GDPR's predecessor. Now what the UK GDPR adds to this um, is to, to these two established categories is the following Article 21A of the UK GDPR provides that unstructured manual information that public authorities process constitutes personal data. I'll say that again. Article 21A of the UK GDPR provides that unstructured manual information that public authorities process constitutes personal data. So this is a third category uh, in addition to the ones that I've already mentioned. This would, for example, cover paper records that a paper uh, that a public authority uh, holds, but holds not as part of the filing system. Now, what are the implications of this? Um, public authorities may have to search such unstructured manual information, for example, to comply with a subject access request. Um, that said, there are exemptions to this new addition to the UK GDPR, specifically, Public authorities are not obliged to, um, to, to, for example, in the context of, a, of an SAR, um, comply with a request by looking for this type of unstructured manual information. 
um, if the request does not contain a description of the unstructured data, or if the public authority estimates that the cost of complying with the request would exceed the um, appropriate amount, which the ICO advises currently is £600 for central government and £450 for all other public authorities. And the ICO has some guidance on its website as to how uh, you ought to calculate that amount, looking at how many hours, for example, are being spent on this by, by employees and, and what hourly rate you ought to assign, uh, assign to that. Secondly, public authorities are also not obliged to comply with requests for unstructured paper records if the personal data is about appointments, removals, pay, etc., in relation to service in any office or employment, either under the Crown or any other um, public authority. And so if it has to do uh, with something related to that, um, then the third category, that of unstructured manual information, uh, is also inapplicable. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the next thing I want to bring to everybody's attention is privacy notices. Um, this is something that I'm very interested in. I've, I've drafted and reviewed uh, a number myself, and um, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite an interesting exercise. And I mention it because obviously um, the, the main point here is that we now operate under a different system. Yes, as Estelle has said, most of the key concepts have stayed the same. However, your privacy notices would still be out of date, technically speaking, if it refers, if they refer to the EU provisions rather than the UK GDPR provisions. And so reviewing those privacy notices will effectively communi communicate that we are living in a post-Brexit data protection world. Um, and, and that those are being kept up to date um, to reflect that. Um, privacy notices, more generally speaking, whether they relate to things that you do on your organization's website or to other services, so face-to-face -face services, for example, are an important aspect of data protection law. And they're in fact also a very helpful tool because they allow organizations and individual professionals to meet their data protection uh, requirements or obligations, um, including the principle of transparency, which is a key requirement under the UK GDPR and has remained a key requirement um, since the predecessor was enacted in 2018. Having a privacy notice in place makes your life, while strictly speaking, you don't need one, it is in one way, definitely best practice to have one. In the other, uh, in another way, it makes your life much easier because you're effectively able to tick the compliance box as far as transparency is concerned. If you don't have a privacy notice in which you tell people how you process their data, so how you collect it, how you store it, and how you potentially transfer it on, you would effectively have to communicate that information every time you're processing somebody's data. So it's a shortcut and it's essentially um, allowing you to have time to do other things rather than constantly having to communicate to people, this is what we were doing with your personal data. Um, so it's in general, a very good thing to have uh, and makes everyone's life much easier. In the context of what we're talking about today, um, reflecting on the, um, on whether your privacy notice is up to date will allow you to think a bit more carefully uh, in general about how it is that you process people's data. And so it will, it will require you to reflect on things like who's our um, a data protection officer, for example, if you have one or if you're required to have one. Um, and it will, um, it will allow you to reflect on a number of other important issues as well. Um, for example, how do we actually process data that comes into our possession. Um, many of you may uh, be working for organizations or ad are advising organizations where there are different channels or different websites or different tools and programs that are being used to, to process people's data. And I've, I've given an answer to uh, a question that was asked in the Q&A box uh, or the Q&A chat 
about the use of WhatsApp, um, for example. So you could set all of these things out in your privacy notice. Um, likewise, it is really helpful to constantly review your privacy notice um, in light of also the fact that you need to keep your uh, data security measures under review. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about that. Stealth flagged that up earlier. Um, many of you will have come across the recent ICO penalty notice against the law firm where it was found that they didn't have adequate data security measures in place. And so you, you need to constantly be reflecting on that to see if, if you are still um, having state-of-the-art uh, data security measures in place. Uh, next slide, please. So this is about children's personal data, as the slide suggests. The new ICO, uh, John Edwards, who replaced Elizabeth Denham in January of 2022 as Information Commissioner, um, has made children's personal data a key data protection theme. And as you can see on this slide, the UK has opted for a relatively low age of consent. So parental consent is required for children below the age of 13. Um, of course, that only applies where you're relying on consent as your lawful basis for processing. There may be another basis that you wish to rely on. Um, there are exceptions to this as well. For example, if you're offering an online service that is um, preventative or um, is a counselling service, there the rules on consent uh, change somewhat. But what is worth looking at in any case is that if you're an organisation um, that processes children's data quite regularly, and I'm looking here mainly at our um, colleagues at uh, local authority, uh, social care um, and children's departments, um, where you're obviously processing children's data, uh, personal data on a regular basis, including special category data or highly sensitive data. Um, just be mindful of the fact, many of you might not be aware, um, that special rules apply to children. And the ICO has quite helpful resources on that topic, including templates and guidance and different kinds of tools that are aimed at helping organization processing children's data to align their processes with the UK's uh, Children's Code, which was adopted in September of 2021. Um, so, Again, just a point to reflect on, this is not strictly speaking something that was introduced by the UK GDPR, but it's something that the ICO has made a key theme at the moment and where we've had, for example, the Children's Code being, uh, being adopted after the UK GDPR entered into force. So in that sense, it still folds within the topic uh, of that we're discussing today. Um, as a general point, realize that children have the same rights as adults over their personal data, right? So everything that Estelle mentioned earlier about the rights to access to personal data, uh, the right to request rectification, um, objection to processing, etc. All of that um, uh, applies to children equally. And the ICO says on its website that if you do process children's personal data on a regular basis, um, that it is recommended that you actually have a designated children's uh, privacy notice in place uh, where you use slightly different language. Privacy notices are meant to always be using simple language for everybody to understand and not be drafted in a very legalistic way, but to, um, to make it to, to write it in such a way that even children can understand it. And so that's something, again, to, to reflect on and to perhaps familiarize yourselves with the different tools that are available, should this be uh, something that applies to you. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, you may have come across the terms frozen GDPR and legacy data. Now, what's that all about? Basically, if you hold any overseas data that was collected before the 1st of January of 2021, remember the cutoff date for the UK GDPR was the 31st of December of 2020, um, that data, so overseas data collected prior to that point, is referred to as legacy data. 
Initially, that kind of data was subject to the EU GDPR as it stood on exit day, so on the 31st of December of 2020. Um, this is why that version of the EU GDPR is known as frozen GDPR, because it effectively froze the EU GDPR provisions as they stood at that time, meaning not taking into account any changes made to the EU GDPR after the 31st of December of 2020. And all of that was done to ensure that there was no change in the level of protection given to non-UK personal data at the end of the transition period. The frozen GDPR no longer applies to the vast majority of legacy data as the European Commission, you may be well aware of this, uh, the European Commission adopted an adequacy decision under the EU GDPR and Law Enforcement Directive for the UK uh, in June of 2021, so about a year ago, um, having determined that UK data protection laws provide a level of protection essentially equivalent to that under the EU regime. Now, obviously, on the basis of what Estelle has told you about how little has in substance really changed, um, that is not surprising. This means that legacy data will be dealt with as any other data would. So under the UK GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018, um, the frozen GDPR no longer applies to that non-UK personal data. However, there are two things to note. First, the adequacy decision, um, if the adequacy decision gets revoked, then any legacy non-UK personal data would again have to be pro processed to an essentially equivalent standard um, as the frozen uh, GDPR. And second, the adequacy decision does not cover data transfer to the UK um, uh, from the EEA for the purposes of immigration control. Um, and so that's, that's, a, um, that's an exception to the adequacy decision effectively. Next slide, please. So after all this, um, what, what else is there to say about the EU GDPR? Um, I've said a little bit about the frozen version of it, but the, the, the sort of alive and well uh, EU GDPR that continues to operate across the continent um, continues to have extraterritorial effect. So what that means is that the EU GDPR continues to apply to UK controllers or processes who have an establishment in the EU or who offer goods or services to data subjects in the EU or who monitor their behavior as far as their behavior takes place within the EU. So if any of those scenarios apply to your organization or authority, um, you are subject to what is effectively a dual data protection regulatory regime. So you're, um, you, you need to be mindful both of the UK GDPR and the EU GDPR to the extent that there are any differences. Next slide, please. I'll finish my part of the webinar by looking at uh, three recent cases and decisions. Um, now that we've discussed what has stayed the same and what has changed from a legislative and ICO guidance perspective, the idea is to have a look at a few decisions that have been made since the UK GDPR entered into force. They are not necessarily, they're not based on the new regime as such, um, and there are very few decisions which are. So um, I think if in West law you specifically look for UK GDPR mentions in case law, you get about seven results and I think a number of them only mention the phrase, but the actual case itself is not based on the UK GDPR. Um, I don't know if there's something wrong with the formatting. Uh, ah, okay, <laughs> perfect, thank you. Um, so the first case um, that I want to discuss, and just uh, as a note, I'm mentioning these because I don't think they would be decided in any other way under the, the new regime, um, but it, they just reflect uh, things to be, again, mindful of, reflect on, uh, and uh, uh, recent developments that are important uh, to, uh, I would assume, the majority of our listeners. Um, so the first case is one that I mentioned earlier, which many of you will have read about on websites such as Local Government Lawyer, and that's the ICO's penalty notice um, against Tucker's Solicitors LLP. Um, the headline is that in February of this year, the ICO fined Tucker's 
uh, £98,000 for a breach of Article 5. Um, the penalty imposed reflected 3.25% of Taka's annual turnover, um, the upper limit being uh, 4%, as we heard earlier. The ICO found that during the period of 25th of May of 2018, so when the EU GDPR entered into force, to the 25th of August of 2020, the firm failed to process personal data in a manner that ensured appropriate security of the personal data, including protection against unauthorized or unlawful processing and against accidental loss. Um, Tucker's essentially in August of 2020 became aware of a ransomware attack on its systems um, and uh, determined that that had led to a personal data breach, but it reported, which it reported to the ICO um, and uh, various reported through various other channels to inform people that this had happened. The attack resulted in the encryption by the malicious uh, criminal actor, so the, the attacker of almost 1 million individual files, of which 24,000 related to court bundles and of the encrypted bundles that were obtained, 60 um, were exfiltrated by the attacker and were subsequently released um, on, on the uh, underground data marketplace. So um, quite a sensitive situation, obviously, especially seeing as this is potentially legally sensitive data as well. Um, the penalty notice, conscious of time, is relevant for everybody really who's processing personal information because it brings into sharp focus um, IT security measures and particularly what it means to have state-of-the-art um, security measures in place, which is something that the ICO looked at. And you can read about that in the penalty notice itself. The ICO looked at various um, industry strand standards of good practice, um, including uh, guidance from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, um, various sector or industry specific, uh, or one sector industry specific guidance um, from the Solicitors Regulatory Authority and, and, and other things as well. Um, bear in mind that two of the key things that the ICO focused on was two-factor or multi-factor authentication and the sufficient encryption of data. So um, I would again invite all of us, obviously this applies to barristers as well, um, to, to make sure um, that you reflect on whether your security measures are up to date or representing uh, state-of-the-art uh, security measures. Then we have Ali and Luton Borough Council. Um, I'll just discuss this very, very briefly. Um, this is a case in which the High Court explained and applied the principles governing vicarious liability in the data protection context, uh, effectively applying uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Morrison's, which was decided in 2020. The council was faced with a situation where one of its employees had gone rogue effectively and had accessed um, documents, files um, with very sensitive data um, uh, in, in, the, in the authorities' children's department um, and um, passed that on to others. And the question arose whether the local authority would be vicariously liable for one of its employees accessing the files, um, photographing them, printing them, and then passing them on. Um, the employee was subsequently arrested and convicted of an offence uh, with a suspended prison sentence, um, and the claimant... Uh, Ali, then Mr. Ali, Mrs. Ali, um, then sued the council, uh, alleging that it, the council was variously liable for its employees' actions. Um, the High Court found that in doing what the employee did, uh, she was engaged solely in pursuing her own agenda. Um, so the fact that it's sort of aligned or was, was connected indirectly to her role um, and safeguarding children, uh, which was part of her job, um, that wasn't enough to, to, to show that she was engaged in furthering the employer's business, uh, which is the, the, the key test that we face or that we need to apply under vicarious liability. While the decision may come as a welcome relief for local authorities, I would suggest that it also serves 
as a reminder of the potential for problems in this area. Um, this case, it's on the extreme end of what employees can do with sensitive data they have access to uh, in case of a similar, in cases of a similar nature with a perhaps a lower level of criminality, um, the, the courts would still consider whether there was a close connection between what the employee was tasked with as part of their employment and the wrongful act committed. Um, and so, um, again, it is a, an invitation um, from me to, uh, for everyone to, um, to think about what kind of policies, for example, local authorities have in place to prevent that kind of situation from happening, what kind of oversights are there in place. Um, in Ali, the court heard witness evidence around, for example, access to information um, by the employee, including the policies and procedures the council had in place to safeguard the information held by the children's services team. And so that is just, again, something to, to reflect on. Two sentences on the third case, um, Stradler and Curry's. Um, just very briefly, this is a case in a line of high court cases decided over the course of last year, and now um, Stradler um, was decided this year. Um, a line of cases where the High Court effectively said that, look, low-key data breach claims are not a matter for the High Court media and communications list. Uh, they are most appropriately dealt with at the county court level uh, and the small claims on the small claims track. Uh, and uh, Stradler and other cases, including Warren and DSG and Johnson and Eastlight, include very helpful points on the various causes of actions that can be pleaded as well. Um, these cases are not very forgiving for, you know, the multiple alternative causes of legal action pleadings that you often see in these types of cases, including misuse of information, breach of confidentiality, and et cetera. And so effectively, the High Court has been narrowing down what claimants in these types of cases can plead and can achieve and where to issue the claim. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. So um, back to me uh, to have a little soups on of what's coming in the future, and then we'll address some of your questions. We've been typing away as well during the, the course of the webinar. So two key things I want to address with what's going to happen in future. Um, first, looking at the privacy and electronic communication regulations. Um, you may be aware that towards the end of last year in September, the government published a consultation on wider reforms in relation to the UK data protection regime, but also um, in particular looking at e-privacy. And as part of those reforms, what's being looked at um, include the following. Um, certain types of analytical cookies being allowed to be placed without consent, um, a, a broader basis for legitimate interests to uh, place cookies on devices without consent, uh, solutions that might reduce or remove the need for um, cookie consent banners altogether, um, expanding the soft opt-out, uh, or sorry, soft opt-in for direct marketing to non-commercial organisations or to individuals and significantly increasing um, the maximum fine um, under the PECA regulations uh, to align with the GDPR. So apart from that last bit, you'll see that the emphasis in particular in relation to the changes under PECA are to make uh, interaction um, and especially electronic interaction um, easier and the placing of cookies um, easier. Uh, the Queen's speech also um, announced very significant uh, data protection changes. The data reform bill is going to be brought forward. Uh, the response by the government to the consultation in September hasn't been released yet, but it's clear that it will be and it will be soon and it will give rise to the data reform bill. Um, the explanatory notes in the data reform bill um, tell us that it's it is going to be a UK wide reform, but some uh, elements will only apply uh, to England and Wales. Um, the bill will in particular look at um, health data um, and health and um, social care uh, data um, being improved. That I think is going to look at the um, sharing of information um, and also potentially quite controversially uh, may look at private entities having access to that information. Um, the purpose of the bill is also stated to modernize the information commissioner's office. Um, if that follows the consultation, then one of the things that might be done in that regard is to try and reduce uh, the direct access of individual complainants to the ICO 
uh, by essentially requiring um, in a much more specific way there to be an initial complaint to the controller or the processor before the complaint goes to the information commissioner. So a bit like the freedom of information regime as it applies to public authorities, where you have an obligation to complain first to the, um, the entity that you are dealing with before you go to the information commissioner's office, that is probably going to be brought in in relation to um, data protection. Uh, we can discuss um, during the uh, question time um, whether you think that's a good or a bad thing. Then uh, using the oops, sorry, then using the um, reform of the regulations to allow more efficient data sharing uh, and uh, a more flexible basis, uh, a customer centred and outcomes focused basis uh, to certain uh, data protection uh, obligations rather than a tick box exercise was what was said in the Queen's speech. That I think is code for saying that uh, the uh, accountability obligations, in particular the document retention obligations, uh, are likely to be changed, um, amended, slash watered down. So of course stepping back, the big question for the United Kingdom is how are these reforms going to affect our adequacy uh, decision because at the moment we are considered to have an adequate um, system of protection so although we're a third country in relation to the European Union we have adequacy so data protection can, data can flow under the data protection regime as it currently is very easily um, between the EU and the United Kingdom but the further that we move away from the uh, UK from the EU GDPR uh, the more difficult the, that adequacy um, equation becomes and indeed the EU was concerned by that when the adequacy decision was made and the adequacy, the adequacy decision is going to be reviewed um, four years from when it took um, force so we know that um, the further we move away the more difficult that adequacy discussion becomes. I mean plainly there's a very significant emphasis for both countries to allow there to be adequacy because we don't really want there to be um, that uh, difficulties in the flow of information. Uh, but we know that the EU is very concerned to ensure that its adequacy standards are maintained. Uh, so uh, watch that space and we may well have the frozen GDPR coming back to haunt us. Right. Um, turning on to your questions, as I say, we've been answering your questions in the chat, but uh, I want to kick off with answering one of the questions that was asked um, in the run up to the webinar. Um, so thank you very much for those questions. Um, and one of the questions that was asked was about this question of sharing data internationally, internationally transferring um, information in particular to the US uh, and uh, what is the situation with that? Um, well, you may have seen um, that that's changed quite a lot recently. Um, first, in relation to general transfers, um, you'll have seen that the Secretary of State on 2nd of February laid before Parliament something called the International Data Transfer Agreement and an update in relation to standard contractual clauses. Um, lots of information has been put out in particular by the ICO um, uh, on the way in which companies, corporate entities and authorities can use this new international data transfer agreement and can use the updated st st um, standard contractual clauses um, in order to transfer um, information internationally. So have a look on the ICO's website because there's lots of information in that regard. Um, moving on to the US, um, for those who are joining who are um, particularly interested in law enforcement matters, you'll be aware that the United Kingdom has been in the forefront of um, putting in place a bilateral agreement with the United States um, in relation to making demands um, for information, the US making demands of the UK and the UK making demands of the US in particular in relation to law enforcement information. We know that there's going to be an emphasis on um, that law enforcement flow of information being kept open um, and there is a bespoke agreement um, in place with the US. Um, looking more broadly in relation to transferring information to the US, uh, there's an emphasis on uh, the use of standard contractual clauses and making sure that uh, you have uh, good clauses in place. There's quite a lot of um, emphasis by in the EU uh, in ensuring that um, there's a bilateral agreement to replace the privacy shield or to enhance the privacy shield. Uh, plainly, that's only going to be an EU-US agreement 
Uh, but the United Kingdom is looking at that quite carefully. Um, and I think there'll be a, a very significant push to have something very similar in place with the United Kingdom very quickly. Um, just something to mention before I hand over to Christina for some other questions. Um, one of the things you might be thinking about in relation to um, transfers um, is whether you, you need to undertake uh, what's known as a transfer impact assessment before you undertake your transfers. And that's very much as you would imagine it to be a sort of specific data protection impact assessment, but tailored for the transfer arena. Uh, and there's some guidance out there. You can have a look about how transfer impact assessments can help manage your risk down if you're transferring. So, Christina, do you want to cover some of the other questions that were asked? Sure. Um, so the first question that I picked was what are the specific UK rules and conditions that permit the processing and passing on of data where it is requested or needed for civil litigation? Now, again, I'm sure this is a situation that many of you um, would have come across. Um, it's a very broad question and a very broad topic. So these are just a few thoughts that I had. Um, first of all, I think the answer to that question really depends on what the basis um, and the nature of the request is. So for example, if it is a third party disclosure order in the court of protection directed at your organization, that is obviously something that needs to be complied with as would any would be the case under any uh, other court order. But you may wish to redact any personal information that is not directly relevant to the matter in question. If it is something outside or out other than a court order, I think there are a number of things that you would need to consider, uh, including whether, of course, the information is legally privileged or otherwise confidential, and whether, for example, you need to obtain consent. The key provisions that I would invite you to look at, and they remain the ones that have always been in place since the DPA has been uh, has entered into force, is paragraph five. Uh, three of the of Schedule Two to the Data um, Protection Act of 2018. Uh, this is an exemption which provides that certain GDPR provisions do not apply. Uh, so, if, for example, you may not need to obtain consent to personal data in three specific circumstances, and two of those circumstances listed specifically address situations that are related to litigation. So, the first is. Um, disclosure of the data is necessary for the purpose of or in connection with legal proceedings, including prospective legal proceedings. And then the third is whether disclosure of the data is otherwise necessary for the purposes of establishing, exercising or defending legal rights. Um, there hasn't been a lot of case law around this area. And again, as I said, I know that this is something that regularly comes up. Um, I would invite you to have a look at a 2021, I believe, a first year tribunal decision, uh, Lucky Technology Limited and Revenue and Customs Commissioners, which directly looks at paragraph 53 of Schedule 2 to the Data Protection Act. The second question that I wanted to discuss is one um, that is, I think, related to the one that we just discussed which is about um, data sharing between different council departments. Um, so the example uses the following uh, in the process of, I believe it was housing uh, legal proceedings. I want to use, I'm assuming this person is a, um, is a, is a council employee uh, or officer. I want to use the council's electoral services and council tax records. Um, can I demand them unredacted? Um, obviously, you can always demand, I guess the question is what happens on the other side. Again, there hasn't been any case law on this, and so we need to go back to the legislation. We need to ask ourselves to what extent paragraph 5 of Schedule 2 can help us in answering these questions. Um, in general, again, um, if you can obtain consent for the sharing, um, that is obviously your safest bet. If consent cannot be obtained, um, again, you will have to look at whether there is a court order or whether you might be able to obtain a court order such that, not specifically for that, but as part of another court order, um, such that disclosure can be made, or if it's disclosure in, in, in the ordinary course of, um, of disclosure uh, in, in civil litigation more generally, um, then I think uh, that also 
wouldn't be a problem. But again, any personal data that isn't directly relevant to the matter concerned or that concerns individuals um, that are not don't have to be named, uh, it's always prudent to redact that information. I think a more general point, and then I, I'll hand over to Estelle. I don't know if and maybe you'll, you've picked another another question um, from the ones that have come in. Um, in the interest of efficiency and clarity, I think it may be worth while for councils or council departments to put their heads together and devise some sort of internal data sharing policy, um, obviously with input from your from your legal teams, such that the question doesn't always have to be determined on the spot in every new situation. Because as I said, this is something that very regularly occurs within councils, such that your offices are then um, more, uh, more aware of the legal framework but also um, so that there is a policy, an internal policy in place that governs how those types of internal sharing requests will be dealt with. Super, thank you very much indeed, Christina. So we have a few minutes. The question that I have indicated um, I want to answer live is about um, the biggest risk for the UK adequacy, i.e. the EU considering the UK to be adequate, is our own um, recognition of other countries um, as being adequate for us to be able to transfer um, information uh, under the general adequacy agreement. Um, and Claire asked that question and I absolutely agree that the EU has flagged on a number of occasions um, that the, the, the UK um, having already indicated that we're very keen to put bilateral agreements in place, that we're very keen to have that um, recognition with other countries, um, and that we're very keen to have that recognition with some countries, including, for example, Australia, um, where the EU has very significant concerns about the lack of protections for data um, subjects within Australian law. Uh, I think that's definitely an area to watch. And it, potentially, the, the, the more we see bilateral trade agreements coming in with countries, there's going to be an emphasis also on these types of recognition. Um, and that's going to cause increasing difficulties with our own adequacy uh, status um, with the European Union. Christina, is there any other question that you want to answer live? Um, I was just typing uh, an answer to um, Jenny's question about whether there are any changes in relation to, um, as she puts it, social care data, so special category data. Um, and I was just going to say that as far as I'm aware, as special category data, there haven't been any changes to that. So that would still be the same as it always has been. Uh, I would just flag um, the importance of Schedule 1 of the DPA uh, 2018 um, that outlines the, the additional addi uh, conditions and requirements. So that would also have to be taken into account. It's not just the UK GDPR that determines how to deal with special category data. Um, and one final question. Um, I'll, I'll uh, budge in on a question that was asked to you actually, Christina, by um, Martin about uh, what happens when you have an informal conversation between colleagues about someone um, shouldn't there need to be um, a recording made or a note made or, or something um, recorded about the conversation? And the answer to that question um, is really context specific. Sometimes, depending on the nature of the conversation, there should be a written record made, especially if there was any decision that was undertaken, but sometimes not. And I think the, it, it's important to recognise that under the data protection regime, um, there isn't an obligation to record everything. There isn't an obligation to make into recorded personal information every, dis every discussion about an individual. It will be very case specific. However, if there have been conversations and you're aware of conversations that have taken place and decisions that have been made, which then haven't been recorded, there may be other difficulties with that. There may be a public law problem with that um, about uh, decision making processes being um, not properly uh, complied with or, or being unfair. But it's not really a data protection problem. It might be more of a public law problem. All right. Well, thank you very much indeed. Apologies to those questions where uh, we haven't had an opportunity to answer them. We'll have a review and if we can answer them uh, later on um, via email, then we will do so. Uh, just to flag that this is the, the first 
the flagship, if I may, event for our Information Law Week. Uh, uh, that's not true. And um, we're, we're moving on during the rest of this week to have uh, even um, better and brighter events. Um, so tomorrow we've got Ruchi and John dealing with the do's and don'ts of data sharing. Um, on Thursday, we've got Philip Koppel QC giving a bravura performance on penalties under uh, the DPA and GDPR. Um, that I think is going to be a must see. Um, and then on Friday, we've got Matt Lewin and Rowan Clapp dealing with um, data protection claims, um, looking at um, quantum and about the approach to settlement. Um, thank you very much indeed um, to all of you for joining us today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you later on in the week.